my sweet friends and welcome back to Crochet Every Day with Judy. We're continuing reading from A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court, starting with chapter 32, Dowley's Humiliation. Well, when that cargo arrived towards sunset Saturday afternoon, <clears throat> I had my hands full to keep the Marcos from fainting. They were sure Jones and I were ruined past help, and they blamed themselves as, as access accessories to this bankruptcy. You see, in addition to the dinner materials, which called for a sufficiently round sum, I had bought a lot of extras for the future comfort of the family. <clears throat> for instance, a big lot of wheat, a delicacy as rare to the tables of their class as was ice cream to a hermit's, also a sizable deal dinner table, also two entire pounds of salt, which was another piece of extravagance in those people's eyes, also crockery, stools, the clothes, a small cask of beer, and so on. I instructed, I instructed the Marcoses to keep quiet about this sumptuousness, excuse me, so as to give me a chance to surprise the guests and show off a little. Concerning the new clothes, the simple couple were like children. They were up and down all night to see if it wasn't nearly daylight so that they could put them on, and they were into them at last as much as an hour before dawn was due. Then their pleasure, not to say delirium, was so fresh and novel and inspiring that the sight of it paid me well for the interruptions which my sleep had suffered. The king had slept just as usual, like the dead. The Marcos could not thank him for their clothes, that being forbidden, but they tried every way they could think of to make him see how grateful they were, which all went for nothing. He didn't notice any change. It turned out to be one of those rich and rare fall days, which is just a June day toned down to a degree where it is heaven to be out of doors. Toward noon, the guests arrived, and we assembled under a great tree, and were soon as sociable as old acquaintances. Even the king's reserve melted a little, though it was some little trouble to him to adjust himself to the name of Jones along at first. I had asked him to try to not forget that he was a farmer, but I had also considered it prudent to ask him to let the thing stand at that and not elaborate at any, because he was just the kind of person you could depend on to spoil a little thing like that if you didn't warn him. His tongue was so handy and his spirit so willing, and his information so uncertain. <clears throat> Dowley was in fine feather, and I early got him started, and then adroitly worked him around onto his own history for a text, and himself for a hero, and then it was good to sit there and hear him hum. Self-made man, you know. They know how to talk. They do deserve more credit than any other breed of men. Yes, that is true. And they are among the very first to find it out, too. He told how he had begun life an orphan lad without money and without friends able to help him. How he had lived as the slaves of the meanest master lived. How his day's work was from 16 to 18 hours long and yielded him only enough black bread to keep him in a half-fed condition. <clears throat> how his faithful endeavors finally attracted the attention of a good blacksmith who came near knocking him dead with kindness by suddenly offering, when he was totally unprepared, to take him as his bound apprentice for nine years <clears throat> and give him board and clothes and teach him the trade, or mystery, as Dowley called it. <clears throat> Excuse me. That was his first great rise, his first gorgeous stroke of fortune, and you saw that he couldn't yet speak of it without a sort of eloquent wonder and delight that such a gilded promotion should have fallen to the lot of a common human being. He got no new clothing during his apprenticeship, but on his graduation day, his master tricked him out and spang new tow linens and made him feel unspeakably rich and fine. I remember me of that day, the wheelwright sang out with enthusiasm. And I likewise, cried the mason, I would not believe they were thine own. In fact, I could not. Nor other, shouted Dally with sparkling eyes. I was like to lose my character, the neighbor's wending I had mayhap been stealing. It was a great day, a great day, one forgetteth not days like that. Yes, and his master was a fine man and prosperous and always had a great feast of meat twice in the year, and with it white bread, true wheaten bread, in fact lived like a lord, so to speak, and in time Dowley succeeded to the business and married the daughter. And now consider what has come to pass, said he impressively. Two times in every month there is fresh meat upon my table. He made a pause here to let that fact sink home, then added, and eight times salt meat. It is even true, said the wheelwright with bated breath. <clears throat> I know it of mine own knowledge, said the mason, in the same reverent fashion. <clears throat> On my table appeareth white bread every Sunday in the year, added the master smith with solemnity. I leave it to your own consciences, friends, if this is not also true. By my head, yes, cried the mason. I can testify it, and I do, said the wheelwright. And as to furniture, you shall say yourselves what mine equipment is. 
<clears throat> he waved his hand in fine gesture of granting frank and unhampered freedom of speech and added, speak as ye are moved, speak as ye would speak, and I were not here. Ye have five stools, and of the sweetest workmanship at that, albeit your family is but three, said the wheelwright with deep respect, and six wooden goblets, and six bladders of wood, and two of pewter to eat and drink from withal, said the mason impressively. And I say it as knowing God is my judge, and we tarry not here always, but must answer at the last day for the things said in the body, be they false or be they soothe. Now you know what manner of man I am, Brother Jones, said the smith, with a fine and friendly condescension. And doubtless you would look to find me a man jealous of his due of respect and but sparing of outgo to strangers till their rating and quality be assured. But trouble yourself not as concerning that. Wit ye well, ye shall find me a man that regardeth not these matters, but is willing to receive any he as his fellow and equal that carrieth a right heart in his body, be his worldly estate howsoever modest. And in token of it, here is my hand, and I say with my own mouth, we are equals." equals. And he smiled around on the company with the satisfaction of a God who is doing the handsome and gracious thing, and is quite well well aware of it. <clears throat> the king took the hand with the poorly disguised reluctance, and let go of it as willingly as a lady lets go of a fish, all of which had a good effect, for it was mistaken for an embarrassment natural to one who was being beamed upon by greatness. The dame brought out the table now and set it under the tree. It caused a visible stir of surprise at being brand new and a sumptuous article of deal. Excuse me. But the surprise rose higher still when the dame, with the body oozing easy indifference at every pore, but eyes that gave it all away by absolutely flaming with vanity, slowly unfolded an actual Simon Pure tablecloth and spread it. That was a notch above even the blacksmith's domestic grandeurs, and it hit him hard. You could see it. But Marco was in paradise. You could see that, too. Then the dame brought two fine new stools. Phew, that was a sensation. It was visible in the eyes of every guest. Then she brought two more as calmly as she could. Sensation again, with awed murmurs. Again she brought two, walking on air she was so proud. The guests were petrified, and the mason muttered, There is that about earthly pomps which doth ever move to reverence. As the dame turned away, Marco couldn't help slapping on the climax while the thing was hot. So he said with what was meant for a languid composure, but was a poor imitation of it. These suffice, leave the rest. So there were more yet. It was a fine effect. I couldn't have played the hand better myself. From this out, the madam piled up the surprises with a rush that fired the general astonishment up to a hundred and fifty in the shade, and at the same time paralyzed expression of it down to gasped ohs and ahs and mute upliftings of hands and eyes. She fetched crockery, new and plenty of it, new wooden goblets and other table furniture, and beer, fish, a goose, eggs, roast beef, roast mutton, a ham, a small roast pig, and a wealth of genuine white wheaten bread. Take it by and large, that spread laid everything far and away in the shade that ever that crowd had seen before. And while they sort of waved, and while they sat there just simply stupefied with wonder and awe, I sort of waved my hand as if by accident, and the storekeeper's son emerged from space and said he had come to collect. That's all right, I said indifferently. What is the amount? Give us the items. Then he read off this bill while those three amazed men listened, and serene waves of satisfaction rolled over my soul, and alternate waves of terror and admiration surged over markers. Marcos, sorry. Two pounds salt, 200. Eight dozen pints beer in the wood, 800. Three bushel sweet, 2,700. Two pounds fish, 100. Three hens, 400. One goose, 400. Three dozen eggs, 150. One roast of beef, 450. One roast of mutton, 400. One ham, 800. One sucking pig, 500. Two crockery dinner sets, 6,000. Two men's suits and underwear, 2,800. One stuff and one linsey woolsey gown and underwear, 1,600. Eight wooden goblets, 800. Various table furniture, 10,000. One deal table, 3,000. Eight stools, 4,000. Two miller guns loaded, 3,000. <clears> he <throat> ceased. There was a pale and awful silence. Not a limb stirred. Not a nostril betrayed the passage of breath. Is that all? I asked in a voice of the most perfect calmness. All fair, sir, save that certain matters of light moment are placed together under a head, light, head height sundries. If it would like you, I will separate. It is of no consequence, I said, accompanying the words with a gesture of the most utter indifference. Give me the grand total, please. The clerk leaned against the tree to stay himself and said, 
39,150 mil rays. The wheelwright fell off a stool. The others grabbed the table to save themselves, and there was a deep and general exclamation of, God be with us in the day of disaster. The clerk hastened to say, My father charges me to say he cannot honorably require you to pay it all at this time, and therefore only prayeth you. I paid no more heed than if it were the idle breeze, but with an air of indifference amounting almost to weariness, got out my money and tossed four dollars onto the table. Ah, you should have seen them stare. The clerk was astonished and charmed. He asked me to retain one of the dollars as security until he could go to town, and I interrupted. What, and fetch back nine cents? Nonsense. Take the whole. Keep the change. Verily, this being is made of money. He throweth it away even as if it were dirt. The blacksmith was a crushed man. The clerk took his money and reeled away drunk with fortune. I said to Marco and his wife, Good folk, here is a little trifle for you handing the miller guns as if it were a matter of no consequence, though each of them contained 15 cents in solid cash. And while the poor creatures went to pieces with astonishment and gratitude, I turned to the others and said as calmly as one would ask the time of day, Well, if we are all ready, I judge the dinner is. Come, fall to. Ah, well, it was immense. Yes, it was a daisy. I don't know that I ever put a situation together better or got happier spectacular effects out of the materials available. The bell... The blacksmith, well, he was simply mashed. Land, I wouldn't have felt what that man was feeling for anything in the world. Here he had been blowing and bragging about his grand meat feast twice a year and his fresh meat twice a month and his salt meat twice a week. And his wheat bread every Sunday the year round, all for a family of three, the entire cost for the year, not above 69.2.6, 69 cents, two mills and six mill rays. And all of a sudden, here comes along a man who slashes out nearly four dollars on a single blowout, and not only that, but acts as if it made him tired to handle such small sums. Yes, Dowley was a good deal wilted and shrunk up and collapsed. He had the aspect of a bladder balloon that's been stepped on by a cow. Chapter 33, Sixth Century Political Economy However, I made a dead set at him, and before the first third of the dinner was reached, I had him happy again. It was easy to do, in a country of ranks and castes. You see, in a country where they have ranks and castes, a man isn't ever a man. He is only part of a man. He can't ever get his full growth. You prove your superiority over him in station or rank or fortune. And that's the end of it. He knuckles down. You can't insult him after that. No, I don't mean quite that. Of course you can insult him. I only mean it's difficult, and so unless you've got a lot of useless time on your hands, it doesn't pay to try. I had the Smith's reverence now because I was apparently immensely prosperous and ri excuse me, and rich. I could have had his adoration if I had had some little Jim Crack title of nobility, and not only his, but any commoners in the land, though he were the mightiest production of all the ages in intellect, worth, and character, and I bankrupt in all three. This was to remain so as long as England should exist in the earth, with the spirit of prophecy upon me, I could look into the future and see her erect statues and monuments to her unspeakable Georges and other royal and noble clothes horses, and leave unhonored the creators of this world after God, Gutenberg, Watt, Arkwright, Whitney, Morse, Stevenson, Bell. The king got his cargo aboard, and then the talk not turning upon battle, conquest, or ironclad duel, he dulled down to drowsiness and went off to take a nap. Mrs. Marco cleared the table, placed the beer keg handy, and went away to eat her dinner of leavings in humble privacy, and the rest of us soon drifted into matters near and dear to the hearts of our sort, business and wages, of course. At a first glance, things appeared to be exceeding prosperous in this little tributary kingdom, whose lord was King Bag Bagdemagus, as compared with the state of things in my own region. They had the protection system in full force here, whereas we were working along down toward free trade by easy stages, and were now about halfway. Before long, Dowley and I were doing all the talking, the others hungrily listening. Dowley warmed to his work, snuffed an advantage in the air, and began to put questions which he considered pretty awkward ones for me, and they did have something of that look. In your country, brother, what is the wage of a master bailiff, master hind, carter, shepherd, swineherd? Twenty-five mil rays a day, that is to say, a quarter of a cent. The smith's face beamed with joy. He said, with us they are allowed the double of it. And what may a mechanic get? Carpenter, dauber, pason, mater, mason, painter, blacksmith, wheelwright, and the like? On the average, fifty mil rays, half a cent a day. Ho, ho, with us they are allowed a hundred. 
With us, any good mechanic is allowed a cent a day. I count out the tailor, but not the others. They are all allowed a cent a day, and in driving times, they get more. Yes, up to 110 and even 15 mil rays a day. I've paid 115 myself within the week. Raw for protection, to shield with free trade. And his face shone upon the company like a sunburst. But I didn't scare at all. I rigged up my pile driver and allowed myself 15 minutes to drive him into the earth. Drive him all in. Drive him in till not even the curve of his skull should show above ground. Here is the way I started in on him. I asked, what do you pay a pound for salt? A hundred mil rays. We pay 40. What do you pay for beef and mutton when you buy it? That was a neat hit. It made the color come. It varieth somewhat, but not much. One may say 75 mil rays the pound. We pay 33. What do you pay for eggs? 50 mil rays the dozen. We pay 20. What do you pay for beer? It costs us eight. It costeth us eight and one half mil rays the pint. We get it for four, 25 bottles for a cent. What do you pay for wheat? At the rate of 900 mil rays the bushel. We pay 400. What do you pay for a man's tow linen suit? 13 cents. We pay six. What do you pay for a stuffed gown for the wife of the laborer or the mechanic? We pay eight cents, four mils. Well, observe the difference. You pay eight cents and four mils. We pay only four cents. I prepared now to sock it to him. I said, look here, dear friend, what's become of your high wages you were bragging so about a few minutes ago? And I looked around on the company with placid satisfaction, for I had slipped up on him gradually and tied him hand and foot, you see, without his ever noticing that he was being tied at all. What's become of those noble high wages of yours? I seem to have knocked the stuffing out of all of them, it appears to me. But if you will believe me, he merely looked surprised, that is all. He didn't grasp the situation at all, didn't know he had walked into a trap, didn't discover that he was in a trap. I could have shot him from sheer vexation. With cloudy eye and a struggling intellect, he fetched this out. Mary, I seem not to understand. It is proved that our wages be double thine. How then may it be that thou thou'st knocked therefrom the stuffing? Am I miscall not the wonderly word, this being the first time under grace and providence of God, it hath been granted me to hear it? Well, I was stunned, partly with this unlooked-for stupidity on his part, and partly because his fellows so manifestly sided with him and were of his mind, if you might call it a mind. My position was simple enough, plain enough. How could it ever be simplified more? However, I must try. Why, look here, Brother Dowley, don't you see? Your wages are merely higher than ours in name, not in fact. Hear him. They are the double. You have confessed it yourself. Yes, yes, I don't deny that at all, but that's got nothing to do with it. The amount of the wages in mere coins with meaningless names attached to them to know them by has got nothing to do with it. The thing is, how much can you buy with your wages? That's the idea. While it is true that with you, a good mechanic is allowed about three dollars and a half a year, and with us only about a dollar and seventy-five. There, you're confessing it again. You're confessing it again. Confound it, I've never denied it, I tell you. What I say is this, with us half a dollar buys more than a dollar buys with you, and therefore it stands to reason in the commonest kind of common sense that our wages are higher than yours. He looked dazed and said despairingly, Verily, I cannot make it out. You've just said ours are the higher, and with the same breath you take it back. Oh, great Scott, isn't it possible to get such a simple thing through your head? Now look here, let me illustrate. We pay four cents for a woman's stuff gown. You pay eight cents four mills, which is four mills more than double. What do you allow a laboring woman who works on a farm? Two mills a day. <clears throat> Very good. We allow but half as much. We pay her only a tenth of a cent a day. And again, you're con... Wait. Now you see, the thing is very simple. This time you'll understand it. For instance, it takes your woman 42 days to earn her gown at two mills a day, seven weeks work. But ours earns hers in 40 days, two days short of seven weeks. Your woman has a gown and her whole seven weeks wages are gone. Ours has a gown and two days wages left to buy something else with. There, now you understand it? He looked, well, he, mere, he merely looked dubious. It's the most I can say. So did the others. I waited to let the thing work. Dowley spoke at last and betrayed the fact that he actually hadn't got away from his rooted and grounded superstitions yet. He said with a trifle of hesitancy, but, but you cannot fail to grant that two mils a day is better than one. Shucks, well, of course I hated to give it up, so I chanced another flyer. Let us suppose a case. Suppose one of your journeymen goes out and buys the following articles. One pound of salt, one dozen eggs, one dozen pints of beer, one bushel of wheat, one tow linen suit, five pounds of beef, five pounds of mutton. The lot will cost him 32 cents. 
It takes him 32 working days to earn the money, five weeks and two days. Let him come to us and work 32 days at half the wages. He can buy all those things for a shade under 14 and a half cents. They will cost him a shade under 29 days work and he will have about half a week's wages over. Carry it through the year, he would save nearly a week's wages every two months. Your man, nothing. Thus saving five or six weeks wages in a year, your man, not a cent. Now I reckon you understand that high wages and low wages are phrases that don't mean anything in the world until you find out which of them will buy the most. It was a crusher. But it, alas, it didn't crush. No, I had to give it up. What these people valued was high wages. It didn't seem to be a matter of any consequence to them whether the high wages would buy anything or not. They stood for protection and swore by it, which was reasonable enough, because interested parties gulled them into the notion that it was protection which had created their high wages. I proved to them that in a quarter of a century their wages had advanced but 30 percent, while the cost of living had gone up 100 and that with us, in a shorter time, wages had advanced 40%, while the cost of living had gone steadily down. But it didn't do any good. Nothing could unseat their strange beliefs. Well, I was smarting under a sense of defeat. Undeserved defeat, but what of that? That didn't soften the smart any. And to think of the circumstances. The first statesman of the age, the capablest, capablest man, the best informed man in the entire world, the loftiest, uncrowned head that had moved through the clouds of any political firmament for centuries, sitting here apparently defeated in argument by an ignorant country blacksmith. And I could see that those others were sorry for me, which made me blush till I could smell my whiskers scorching. Put yourself in my place. Feel as mean as I did, as ashamed as I felt. Wouldn't you have struck below the belt to get even? Yes, you would. It is simply human nature. Well, that is what I did. I am not trying to justify it. I am only saying that I was mad and anybody would have done it. Well, when I make up my mind to hit a man, I don't plan out a love tap. No, that isn't my way. As long as I'm going to hit him at all, I'm going to hit him a lifter. And I don't jump at him all of a sudden and risk making a blundering halfway business of it. No, I get away off yonder to one side and work up on him gradually so that he never suspects that I'm going to hit him at all. And by and by, all in a flash, he's flat on his back and he can't tell for the life of him how it all happened. That is the way I went for Brother Dowley. I started talking lazy and comfortable as if I was just talking to pass the time, and the oldest man in the world couldn't have taken the bearings of my starting place and guessed where I was going to fetch up. Boys, there's a good many curious things about law and custom and usage and all that sort of thing when you come to look at it. Yes, and about the drift and progress of human opinion and movement, too. There are written laws. They perish, but there are also unwritten laws. They are eternal. Take the unwritten law of wages. It says they've got to advance little by little straight through the centuries. And notice how it works. We know what wages are, are now, here and there and yonder. We strike an average and say that's the wages of today. We know what the wages were a hundred years ago and what they were two hundred years ago. That's as far back as we can get, but it suffices to give us the law of progress, the measure and rate of the periodical augmentation, and so without a document to help us, we can come pretty close to determining what the wages were three and four and five hundred years ago. Good, so far. Do we stop there? No, we stop looking backward. We face around and apply the law to the future. My friends, I can tell you what people's wages are going to be at any date in the future you want to know for hundreds and hundreds of years. What? Goodman, what? Yes. In 700 years, wages will have risen to six times what they are now here in your region, and farmhands will be allowed three cents a day and mechanics six. I would I might die now and live then, interrupted Smug the wheelwright with a fine avaricious glow in his eye. And that isn't all. They'll get their board besides. Such as it is, it won't bloat them. 250 years later, pay attention now. A mechanic's wages will be, mind you, this is law, not guesswork. A mechanic's wages will then be 20 cents a day. There was a general gasp of awed astonishment. Dickon the make Mason murmured with raised eyes and hands, more than three weeks pay for one day's work? Riches, of a truth, yes, riches, muttered Marco, his breath coming quick and short with excitement. Wages will keep on rising little by little, little by little, as steadily as a tree grows, and at the end of 340 years more, there will be at least one country where the mechanic's average wage will be 200 cents a day. It knocked them absolutely dumb. Not a man of them could get his breath for upward of two minutes. Then the coal burner said prayerfully, might I but live to see it. It is the income of an earl, said Smug. An earl, say ye, said Dowley, you could say more than that and speak no lie. There's no earl in the realm of Bagdemagus that hath an income like to that. Income of an earl. 
it is the income of an angel. Now then, this is what is going to happen as regards wages. In that remote day, that man will earn with one week's work that bill of goods which it takes you upwards of 50 weeks to earn now. Some other pretty surprising things are going to happen too. Brother Dowley, who is it that determines every spring what the particular wage of each kind of mechanic, laborer, and servant shall be for that year? Sometimes the courts, sometimes the town council, but most of all the magistrate. You may say in general terms it is the magistrate that fixes the wages. Doesn't ask any of those poor devils to help him fix their wages for them, does he? Hmm, that were an idea. The master that's to pay him the money is the one that's rightly concerned in that matter, you will notice. <clears throat> yes, but I thought the other man might have some little trifle at stake in it, too. And even his wife and children, poor creatures. The masters are these, nobles, rich men, the prosperous generally. These few who do no work determine what pay the vast hive shall have who do work. You see, they're a combine, a trade union, to coin a new phrase, who band themselves together to force their lowly brother to take what they choose to give. Thirteen hundred years hence, so says the unwritten law, the combine will be the other way, and then how these fine people's posterity will, posterity will fume and fret and grit their teeth over the insolent tyranny of trade unions. Yes, indeed, the magistrate will tranquilly arrange the wages from now clear away down into the 19th century, and then all of a sudden the wage earner will consider that a couple of thousand years or so is enough of this one-sided sort of thing, and he will rise up and take a hand in fixing his wages himself. Ah, he will have a long and bitter account of wrong and humil humiliation to settle. Do you believe that he actually will help to fix his own wages? Yes, indeed, and he will be strong and able then. Brave times, brave times of a truth, sneered the prosperous smith. Oh, and there's another detail. In that day, a master may hire a man for only just one day or one week or one month at a time if he wants to. What? It's true. Moreover, a magistrate won't be able to force a man to work for a master a whole year on a stretch, whether the man wants to or not. Will there be no law or sense in that day? Both of them, Dowley, in that day, a man will be his own property, not the property of magistrate and master, and he can leave town whenever he wants to if the wages don't suit him, and they can't put him in the pillory for it. Perdition catch such an age, shouted Dowley in strong indignation, an age of dogs, an age of barren of, an age barren of reverence for superiors and respect for authority, the pillory. Oh, wait, brother, say no good word for that institution. I think the pillory ought to be abolished. A most strange idea. Why? Well, I'll tell you why. Is a man ever put in the pillory for a capital crime? No. Is it right to condemn a man to a slight punishment for a small offense and then kill him? There was no answer. I had scored my first point. For the first time, the smith wasn't up and ready. The company noticed it. Good effect. You don't answer, brother. You were about to glorify the pillory a while ago and shed some pity on a future age that isn't going to use it. I think the pillory ought to be abolished. What usually happens when a poor fellow is put in the pillory for some little offense that didn't amount to anything in the world? The mob try to have some fun with him, don't they? Yes. They begin by clotting him and they laugh him themselves to pieces to see him try to dodge one clot and get hit with another? Yes. Then they throw dead cats at him, don't they? Yes. Well then, suppose he has a few personal enemies in that mob, and here and there a woman, or a man or a woman with a secret grudge against him, and suppose especially that he is unpopular in the community for his pride or his prosperity, or one thing or another, stones and bricks take the place of clods and cats presently, don't they? There is no doubt of it. As a rule, he is crippled for life, isn't he? Jaws broken, teeth smashed out, or legs mutilated, gangrene presently cut off, or an eye knocked out, maybe both eyes. It is true, God knoweth it. And if he is unpopular, he can depend on dying right there in the stocks, can't he? He surely can. One may not deny it. I take it none of you are unpopular by reason of pride or insolence or conspicuous prosperity or any of those things that excite envy and malice among the base scum of a village. You wouldn't think it much of a risk to take a chance in the stocks. Dowley winced visibly. I judged he was hit. But he didn't betray it by any spoken word. As for the others, they spoke out plainly and with strong feeling. They said they had seen enough of the stocks to know what a man's chance in them was, and they would never consent to enter them if they could compromise on a quick death by hanging. Well, to change the subject, for I think I've established my point that the stocks ought to be abolished, I think some of our laws are pretty unfair. For instance, if I do a thing which ought to deliver me to the stocks, and you know I did it, and you keep still and don't report me, you will get the stocks if anybody informs on you. 
Ah, but that would serve you but right, said Dowley, for you must inform, so saith the law. The others coincided. Well, all right, let it go since you vote me down. But there's one thing which certainly isn't fair. The magistrate fixes a mechanic's wage at one cent a day, for instance. The law says that if any master shall venture, even under utmost press of business, to pay anything over that cent a day, even for a single day, he shall be both fined and pilloried for it, and whoever knows he did it and doesn't inform, they also shall be fined and pilloried. Now it seems to me unfair, Dowley, and a deadly peril to all of us, that because you thoughtlessly confessed a while ago that within a week you have paid a cent and fifteen mil. Oh, I tell you, it was a smasher. You ought to have seen them go to pieces, the whole gang. I had just slipped up on poor, smiling, and complacent Dowley so nice and easy and softly that he never ex never suspected anything was going to happen till the blow came crashing down and knocked him all to rags. A fine effect, in fact, as fine as any I ever produced with so little time to work it up in. But I saw in a moment that I had overdone the thing a little. I was expecting to scare them, but I wasn't expecting to scare them to death. They were mighty near it, though. You see, they had been a whole lifetime learning to appreciate the pillory, and to have that thing staring them in the face, and every one of them distinctly at the mercy of me, a stranger, if I chose to go and report. Well, it was awful, and they couldn't seem to recover from the shock. They couldn't seem to pull themselves together. Pale, shaky, dumb, pitiful, why, they weren't any better than so many dead men. It was very uncomfortable. Of course, I thought they would appeal to me to keep mum, and then we would shake hands and take a drink all round and laugh it off and there an end. But no, you see, I was an unknown person among a cruelly oppressed and suspicious people, a people always accustomed to having advantage taken of their helplessness and never expecting just or kind treatment from any but their own families and very closest intimates. Appeal to me to be gentle, to be fair, to be generous. Of course they wanted to, but they couldn't dare. We'll stop there and start next time with chapter 34. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye.